We'd like our machines to do what we want. So if a machine is unstable in some way, we sometimes add a control system to regulate it or to steer it where we like. And this can be as familiar as your house thermostat. In a cold climate, a house will tend toward thermal equilibrium with the cold outside air. If you add a furnace and turn it on, then that constantly on furnace might add heat, but it might then reach an equilibrium at much too hot a temperature. So we, then the solution is to add a thermostat, which can turn the furnace on and off. And using a sensor, it can regulate the temperature to a much tighter bound. So let's look a little bit at the kind of linear version of this, which is very common in kind of a uh, single axis control. So as a kind of test case, let's uh, sort of synthetic test case here, let's just consider the idea that we have uh, like some kind of mass, like an inverted pendulum that is somehow attached over a pivot and gravity is pulling it down. So this, is this will be unstable. It might be balanced for an instant, but it'll fall either way. And then like a pendulum, it will, you know, it'll move and oscillate, maybe come to rest at the bottom. So let's say we want it to keep it stabilized at the top. So the first thing we might think is, well, we should add an actuator. Well, maybe that's not the first thing you think, but let's add an actuator. So let's assume that now we can add some kind of torque source at the bottom here, which can exert a torque on the mass um, in this positive direction. So the torque motor can now apply a torque that might keep the, keep the mass toward the top. And then we have the question of like, what kind of torque should we add? And the other obvious answer, maybe not so obvious, is that we should have some kind of sensor. So let's assume that as the mass displaces, that there is some measurement we can make. There's some kind of sensor that tells us theta, which is the, the deviation from vertical, which this is a, will be our, our target here. So at this point, we can start to think about what we have. We have, a, we have a system, I'm just going to do a block diagram here, which is it's an autonomous system to begin with that just um, has some dynamics. This is the sort of gravity dynamics of falling, and it spits out, it just exhibits a, a motion that has theta varying. So then what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, we, can, we, can have, a, we have some input to the system where we can apply a torque via this motor. And then now we're going to start to think, how might we control this? So uh, let's say we can measure the output and apply feedback. So in this case, I'm going to um, hypothesize we also have some desired position for it. Could just be zero at the top. And we're going to take that and we're going to take, an, we're going to take the difference where, where it actually is some summation and get what we call an error signal. An error signal is, uh, that's an E, an error signal is, a, is an indication of how far we are from where we want to be. So as a first cut, let's just think in a kind of linear way. Let's say we just take a gain here, a multiplier, call it, we'll call it K, we'll actually call it K underscore uh, sub P, and, and say we'll feed it back. So now if, it, if, if, the, um, if, the, if the mass starts to fall to the left in a positive theta direction, we'll apply some negative uh, torque to bring it back up. So when the air gets positive because it's, I'm sorry, the air gets negative because it's falling in a positive direction, a negative air is the direction we want to steer, we'll apply a negative torque to bring it back toward the middle. And in practice, that does work. You'll get a, a system that now tends to stay much closer to its stable point. So if we actually sort of plot that out for a second here, let's think about tau as a function of, of, of the error. And it's a linear function. Right? For, for positive or negative error, we have some proportionality that we're applying so that very small errors we apply small torques that's hovering right around the top, larger errors we apply larger torques. And if you remember your physics, this is very close to, well, it's exactly the linear function for an idealized linear spring. So effectively what we've done here by saying that tau is proportional to some error is that we have effectively uh, installed now a kind of virtual spring between the set point and where the, the mass actually is. It's not a real spring, it's a virtual spring. It's, it's, a, it's a force that's applied to the system via the torque motor, which is identical to the force that would be applied by a physical spring. So we've simulated a spring, but of course we've used energy to do that because the motor requires energy. But the result is that the behavior should behave exactly like adding a physical spring. And what you might expect is true. So now that the system if it tends to fall to one side, the spring will stretch, meaning that the error will increase and the torque will increase. And then it'll pull it back toward the middle. And if it has some inertia, it'll oscillate and it'll sort of sway to the other side and sway back. 
And we end up with this system that oscillates around the center. It's just a mass spring system. And in an idealized universe, it would just oscillate forever. It's a sine wave of a, of a, a periodic harmon a harmonic oscillator that would just oscillate around the set point. So often we say, well, we don't want to continue moving. We want it to come to rest. So let's just think about adding another term. At this point, I'm going to switch to the algebraic notation because it's a little simpler than the block diagram notation. So let's think in terms of now we had um, before we had tau equals k proportional times the, the difference of the desired position minus the actual position. And now let's add another term. Let's say we're going to add now a, another a, a gain here, which is k sub d. And for clarity, we're actually going to make that a minus sign. And we're going to multiply this k sub d term times what we're, the velocity. So we're going to assume we have some way of also measuring the velocity of the output, whether we sense the position of the output and take a derivative, or whether we have a physical velocity sensor. So this, if, this you may recognize also from physics, is the equivalent function for a idealized damper. So effectively, now we've also added, in parallel with our spring, we've added some kind of damping component, a rotational damper, between the, between the inverted mass and its set point. The damper is the property that it, the fat, you know, if you try to move quickly, the high velocity is positive. That negative sign means that the damping will apply a negative uh, torque that tends to, uh, tends to reduce that velocity. So now, um, if, it, if for some reason the mass is deviated from zero, the spring will try to bring it back toward the middle and it might, excel, it might oscillate through, but then the damping will be constantly removing energy. And again, it, the, this damper is simulated. It's provided by torques at the motor, and it may actually cost us energy to do so, although we're actually we're removing mechanical energy from the system. So this is called PD control, proportional derivative. The proportional term acts analogously to a spring. The derivative term is the damping term, acts analogous to a damper. But a key thing here is to say that it's, it's not a physical damper or a physical spring. The effects are simulated by the actions of the motor as performed by our calculation. Now, in the, this could be calculated in a variety of ways. It's possible to build a circuit that does this calculation and doesn't require digital computation. We tend to use, these days, digital computing to use a, a processing loop that samples the signal, applies some algebra, you know, math, and then generates another signal. But it goes from the physical into informational and then back to the physical in either case. Now, um, a couple things to sort of consider here, too, is let's say that the torque is limited. Let's say there's some limit on how much torque that you can actually provide. Well, in the physical case, um, as you move off the center, the torque required just to even put key, hold it up, let alone push it back, is constantly increasing to a maximum at some side. So if, if the maximum torque uh, is less than the, than the torque required even to hold it to the side, it's pretty clear that we can't always recover. And there will be some, some set of states for which the mass will simply overcome the motor, and it might possibly fall through as a pendulum. So there's some, what we call a domain of stability. There's going to be some region of the state space, in this case, some range of angles of theta and some range of angles of the velocity that are that inside those bounds, the system converges to the desired position and, and velocity. And then outside those bounds, it may not. And um, control theory uh, spends a lot of energy um, finding ways to precisely calculate these domains of stability and prove them for all kinds of systems and cases. Um, and here we're going to sort of just resort to physical analogy. You know, as long as the as long as the the spring force, as long as the spring doesn't break, right? The spring doesn't exceed some maximum force. We know from physical analogy that it will tend to converge within some limited domain. Let's, let's consider a couple of possibilities of system responses when the target input suddenly changes. So if we think about the the d value here as going having some kind of step. We can see that the, the d value is, is a command, we can change that arbitrarily, and then the system will respond. In this case, the simulated spring will basically suddenly become stretched as the target position suddenly changes. So if the system were um, had no damper, we already know that it might oscillate indefinitely. So we might see some, we might be at some equilibrium, and then we'll see some kind of behavior where it then starts to oscillate around the set point with some amplitude. And that might not be desirable. Uh, we can sort of imagine that with some damping, we might be able to get that to, to damp out over time. And maybe actually in some limit, we can sort of see a couple uh, particular cases. Um, one would be that we 
we said we just sort of approach the target in some asymptotic way at some sort of nice equilibrium where it gets there as fast as possible but without actually any oscillation. That there actually is a specific point called critical damping where that's true. If we're a little less stamped in the critical damping, what we'll see is that we'll get a little overshoot and a little ringing, and then it'll settle down into a, into a particular spot. And if we add extra damping, more than we need, uh, we'll find that the response time will be longer. It'll take longer to reach equilibrium, but it'll do so without oscillation. And I say this without proof, just to say these are a couple of common sort of cases that you can observe, and empirically we'll tune the parameters of the simulator and see that they do indeed come out. Now, this is to back off and say, this is linear feedback. Linear feedback has some nice theoretical properties uh, because it's, it's easy to analyze, there's very good math to support it, uh, but it's by no means the only way to approach this. Your, your thermostat itself was an example of a switching function where it's a binary output. It doesn't, most th furnaces cannot produce proportional heat. And so it's simply on or off. And then the system has some hysteresis so that the temperature gets above a set, uh, below some th set point and the furnace turns on, and then the inertia of the house allows it to sort of steadily heat up until it passes some upper threshold, and then it turns off. And it's the combination of the thermal inertia of the house and the various heat input and output rates that determines how long that oscillation is. And it's some, it's some uh, hysteresis band in, in the thermostat settings that help regulate how far it gets from the desired temperature. And that's actually a po a possible to build all sorts of controllers that are based on switching functions. And they're intrinsically nonlinear, Sometimes they don't have the same kind of analytic properties, but they can be very easy to think about in terms of like sort of intuitively creating a control function. The other question is what about multiple axes? Because almost all real systems have more than one motor. And indeed your rockets and your uh, robots, all these systems have many freedoms. And the dynamics are often coupled where controlling one dynamic involves controlling others. And I'll just sort of leave it on the table and say those systems do require more sophisticated models. And effectively, there's, there can be coupling between the axes where all of the system state, including all the freedoms, are considered in the calculation of how to optimally produce a set of forces or torques that steer the system toward the target. It gets even more exciting when you can't actually measure some of the freedoms, and then part of what's going on is effectively simulation to model and estimate missing data from the system in order to calculate outputs. And there's a whole you know, world of graduate theses available for anyone who wants to do research along those lines. So, the key takeaway ideas here is we basically built an augmented system. We've taken one system, which is just an autonomous you know, mass and gravity system. We've added an actuator and added this function, this mathematical process that it augments the system. And it turns one set of unstable dynamics into a different augmented set of dynamics. The composite system has dynamics that are stable. It does take energy to do that. We need to enter power into our torque motor. But the result is that the you know, by adding this hardware, we can steer the system where we want to go to go. 